five minutes after four, and I'd like to welcome our guests, Patricia Bartos from Price Waterhouse Cooper, and Kim Council, Reverend Kim, who is a community activist in Brooklyn and executive director of the Law Library. Tell me the institution again, Kim. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm a, I'm a reference librarian at uh, Sullivan and Cromwell and executive director at Berean Community and Family Life Center. Oh, I apologize. You're, as we spoke yesterday, you know that my uh, my calendar is, is a big hectic. But I also like to welcome our dean, Dr. Joanne Roll. Uh, Dr. Joanne Roll waved high. <laughs> so, um, and I also like to welcome my colleague, um, Teresa Young, who will be the moderator for our discussion about managing our money. So welcome everyone. Hello and welcome to all of the senior class of measure. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Teresa Young and I am the program director at a shelter and provide aftercare services to families who have moved out of the shelter system. Uh, professionally, I'm a social worker and uh, work with families who are experiencing homelessness. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today and start off by telling you a little bit about our organization. Um, I am here representing the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. Um, the National Coalition is an advocacy organization that was founded in 1981 with 14 chapters in, the District of, uh, in 14 states in the District of Columbia. Our purpose is to advocate for the Black women and girls. And by advocating for Black women, you know you're advocating for every, the needs of everyone. Uh, the coalition does that by launching programs through health, education, and economic empowerment. And today we have with us Patricia Bartos and Kim Council, and we're going to have a discussion about uh, what does life after college and managing your finances look like? So welcome to our two guest speakers, Kim and Patricia. And um, I want to start off telling you a little bit about these two really dynamic women that we're so happy to have with us. Um, Patricia, or Patty as she likes to be called, is the operations manager at Price Waterhouse Cooper. Um, she is also an accountant and she's been at Price Waterhouse for 22 years, um, of which she has led the finance and project management team and the um, part of my page was cut off. I apologize. I'm gonna have do to you want me to it. you want me to introduce myself? I'm happy to do yeah. that. If that works okay. to reset. Great. Perfect. <laughs> So, so my name is Patty Bartos. Um, it's actually Patty Bartos West. Um, I should add that in. I, um, <laughs> and so I am the market operations leader for, um, for PwC. Um, been with the firm for 22 years. Um, I am in this role for two years. Prior to that, I led the finance and project management functions for the firm. Um, I am an accountant, um, but don't do accounting anymore. I've uh, changed careers. I'm no longer worried about debits and credits and all those types of fun things. Um, I am a member of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. I am also on the board of directors uh, for two non-for-profits. One of them is Step Up for Better Living, which is a, a non-for-profit focused on housing and maintaining housing for individuals located in the Bronx. And I'm also a board member of a non-for-profit in Brooklyn called um, Trucked Out, which I've been a member of for over 10 years. That's a little bit about me. I'm the mother of six kids. Um, and six great kids, I will add. I may talk about them in a little bit. Um, and uh, also married. Great. Kim, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, why not? Um, hi, everyone that we cannot see in virtual world. Uh, my name is uh, Kim Council. I am a senior reference librarian at Sullivan and Cromwell LLP. Uh, I've been there for 22 years. 
Uh, I am also the executive director of the Berean Community and Family Life Center, and I'm an associate minister uh, at Berean Baptist Church. Um, I have served as the president of the Law Library Association of Greater New York, which uh, had over 700 members uh, in the uh, metropolitan area. Um, I also have served, at, have served as the president of the East Brooklyn Housing Development Corporation. I'm currently serving as the vice president of the uh, Local Development Corporation of East New York. Um, and served for several years as the secretary of the board of directors of the Berean Community and Family Life Center and was appointed as the executive director in 2018 and also sit on the executive board of Women of Faith Advocating Change um, and have run for uh, office in Brooklyn three times. Okay. Wow, I Two have children. Be. I have children, I'm sorry. I forget <laughs> those <laughs> them. I got you. We're claiming them today. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, as we all can see, we have two very accomplished uh, guests here with us who have really long standing careers at uh, well known organizations, both uh, Berean and Price Waterhouse Coopers, um, who I'm sure you in the business will have heard of. Um, and you know, we all come to our uh, jobs and our careers via different paths. So why don't we start off with you telling us a little bit about your career path and how you got to where you are today. Um, Patricia, why don't you start? Sure. Thanks, Teresa, for that question. So um, when I, I, I'm a graduate from Hofstra University. Um, I was a marketing major. Um, I chose that major, actually, because seemed to be the simplest business major, believe it or not. Um, so I chose that major. Um, one other quick thing about it, um, when I joined or when I first went to Hofstra, um, the teachers were on strike my freshman year when we first got there. And they were on strike for the first three weeks of us being on campus. I have to tell you, my graduating class from Hofstra had the lowest GPA out of any graduating class ever at Hofstra because we started out with like this whole party mode, trying to buckle down after being kind of hanging out for three weeks, it was, it was interesting. So um, went to Hofstra, was a marketing major, came out, went into advertising for a couple of years um, at a large company uh, called Saatchi and Saatchi Advertising. I have always worked for large companies. I, I, that's kind of where I have always played. Um, did that for a couple of years. It was interesting um, and then decided to do something different and go into the finance world. Went back to school um, so that I can get my CPA license. Did that um, and worked for a small brokerage house for a little bit of time and then went to PD PwC, which is where I've been um, for the past 22 years. Um, the thing that's interesting when you think about your career path, um, what you go to school for right now may not be what you go, what you wind up doing. And I think it's very important for people to have flexibility and be agile when you come out of school because you may work in completely different areas than what you go to school for. And so um, people, when they, you know, ask me, you know, why are you at PwC so long? Quite frankly, I, it's because, you know, I enjoyed the firm that I'm working at, but I never thought I would be there because I really thought I would stay in the, in the advertising marketing arena. So that's kind of my path there. Great. You know, our path can really take a lot of twists and turns and you have to keep yourself open to new challenges and adventures. And I think your career demonstrates that. Um, Kim, what about you? What has your career path been like? Um, well, I went uh, to North Carolina Central University down in Durham, North Carolina. I was there for four years, had a wonderful time, enjoyed uh, the experience. Um, I didn't get really serious about my academics probably until my senior year. Um, I joined a sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. I think I spent my entire sophomore year hiding from people, and my junior year I was trying to make up for what um, happened to me during my sophomore year. And my senior year I realized I got to get out of here, um, so I got serious. Um, and uh, I had uh, three part-time jobs while I was in college. Um, so, you know, worked really, really hard, but made sure that, you know, we got out. Uh, when I graduated from college, I got a job working at McKinsey and Company, a uh, management consulting firm in Midtown. Um, and while working at McKinsey, 
I was working in the library. They called it the Information Resource uh, Center. Um, and they had a program that would um, pay for you to get your, your graduate degree. So I decided to take advantage of that and got my master's degree in library science from Pratt Institute. Um, and while I was at McKinsey on maternity leave, they began a cost effective initiative. Um, so I uh, went to a headhunter, went on one job interview, and that's when I got the job working at Sullivan and Cromwell. Um, so I finished up the master's degree. So I came to Sullivan and Cromwell as a paraprofessional, um, finished up the master's degree, and then was promoted to uh, reference librarian and have been at Sullivan and Cromwell since 1998. Um, so I was a political science major undergrad. I thought about going to law school, but then decided not to do that. Um, but I am working at a law firm, so, you know, we're putting that to, to use. And then <clears throat> I had to call the poll for ministry um, and had a conversation with my pastor. And, um, you know, we went through the process of what I needed to go through in order to become a, a licensed minister in 2003. And I was ordained in 2006. Um, and so, you know, like I, I the board work, um, outside of the career um, is really kind of what drives the advocacy piece of, of what I do. Um, and so sitting on the board for the Berea Community Family Life Center, uh, when the executive director uh, got another job, you know, they looked and said, well, Kim, would you, you know, mind taking that over? So in my spare time, um, I, I worked <laughs> as the executive director of the Family Life Center. So I still, I work at Sullivan and Cromwell from like eight to four, I leave Sullivan and Cromwell and go to the Family Life Center and, and run youth programs, senior programming, uh, women's empowerment workshops and things of that nature. So that's kind of been the trajectory of. Yes. And because you have so much time, you are taking on yet more challenges. <laughs> can, I, can I say something there, Teresa, as it relates to that? So, so can I do think and doing community service should be a critical part of um, it, it. Giving back and reaching back, providing assistance for those who may not have what you have. Um, all of you on the call, I mean, you're all a rare breed, right? Um, that are going to college and, and, and achieving your dreams and stuff like that. I think it's very important to look for opportunities where you can interact and volunteer. I think. It, helps to build your network. It helps to give you different experiences and the, the feeling of giving back is tremendous. So I'll share the organization that I mentioned, um, Trucked Out, happens to be uh, an organization that functions in the Brownsville, East New York area. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's one of those like SUV clubs um, or like those motorcycle clubs. Um, and it's kind of weird because when you think about my professional career, it's like a whole different side of me. Um, and so Trucked Out has a relationship with Toys for Tots. And believe it or not, we go around and pick up toys from all different locations all over the city and bring it to uh, Floyd Bennett Field and in, in Brooklyn and, and distribute toys. Um, and on Christmas Day, um, and I've done this for the past, I guess, 11 years now. Um, all of us meet up, we load up our trucks, we go to a, there's a park on Mother Gaskin, I think it's Sutter. Um, and we give out Christmas toys every single Christmas. Oh, Betsy Head Park. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 not in Betsy Head. It's like right across the street, there's a gas station right there. And we give out toys every single Christmas um, to children in the, in the community. And I force my children to go with me because it's important for them to also realize how important and how blessed they are and how important it is to give back to others. So just be prepared for that as part of your journey and something you can do. Be civically engaged. In your community and at your school, um, really provide opportunities for you. So, what are some of the um, lessons that you've learned doing your uh, volunteer work and that you have been able to utilize in your work, your profession in a professional capacity? You want to take that first, Kim? <laughs> Whoa, I, <laughs> um, what are some of the things that I've learned about? Well, um, I think we have more in common than we don't, you know, um, so I think, you know, whether you're, you know, in Bed-Stuy or in Brownsville or, um, you know, at Sullivan and Cromwell at the core, most people want the same thing. 
Um, you know, they want to be able to take care of their families. They want to be able to um, pay their bills, and, and they like to be able to, you know, hang out, socialize a little bit. Um, so uh, some some lessons that I've learned. I don't know. I mean, like, that's, that, 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 that seems kind of, you know, that seems like a challenging question. But, I, I mean, I've learned. Um, oh, God. Hard work pays off. Um, it always pays off. You definitely have to work hard to achieve your goals, um, whether it's in corporate America or it's in the community. Um, you know, those types of things. People value um, hard work. Um, and who you are, it's important to remain true to who you are, regardless of what venue you find yourself in. Um, whether I'm at Sullivan and Cromwell or I'm walking, you know, around in my neighborhood, I'm Kim. I am Kim. I am, you know, there are no heirs here. Um, and I think, you know, that helps uh, to, to build relationships. And relationships are very important. Relationships are important in work. Um, they're important at your place of employment. They're important within your community. Um, you know, and one of the things you'll find as you're walking around the community is, you know, like there will be people who are influential. Um, and there will there'll be people who are influential in the community. There will be people who are influential at your job. And it's very important for you to, you know, maintain relationships with those types of people. Um, so be true to yourself. Uh, people are ultimately, they might act like they're different, but they're ultimately the same. Um, work hard um, and be accountable for who you are, what you do. Those things are important. So when I think about what I've learned um, from my volunteer work and, and um, I've learned the importance of networking, right? So when I think even about the coalition, right? Um, you know, the, the women that I have met through the coalition have, are just phenomenal, just, just phenomenal women, just doing just great things. So I, I, I think the, the connections I've made there have been important. Um, I think I've learned that you can learn something from anyone, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, can, it, it doesn't have to be as someone who's your boss. It, it doesn't, ha it could be a child that you can learn something from and, and And you have to be open to learning from others, right? I think the more that you interact with people, um, the better you're, I keep talking about network because that is key to anything, right? Having that network. Mm -hmm of people that you can connect with on various different levels. And like Kim said, there is, we talk about seven degrees of separation, quite frankly, like we were on the phone yesterday. It's like one degree of separation, um, especially amongst our community, right? And so um, just, just being open to, to learn from anybody, I think um, it's important to realize that nobody's better than anyone else um, and, and, and carry yourself as such um, and being willing to help anyone who's in need, no matter what it is, because there may be a time that you may need. Um, and so looking out for others and, and but just learning, being open to learning anywhere you possibly can. Um, one thing that I often talk to, and I do a lot of training and interacting and stuff like that at my firm, um, is that um, be, be open-minded, even though you're getting out of school, you're gonna graduate, you should always be learning, always be reading, always trying to increase your business acumen, um, in terms of like, you can learn from Facebook, Instagram, all these other things that I don't do. I do do Facebook and Instagram and, and no, Facebook and LinkedIn, but, but read everything, read newspaper articles, read blogs. There's always something that you can take from that that will allow you to interact with greater impact with people that you meet. So, mm -hmm. so that, that's what I learned from my volunteering, just, just meeting everyone and being open and friendly and, and kind and kind. Because that's what volunteering is about, is kindness. That's true. Thank you for that. You know, you mentioned bringing, um, showing up every day and bringing your true and authentic self. And I think that that is so important, especially when you're going to be uh, looking for employment. You don't want to show up as one person on your interview and then you get the job and you're in a position where you're miserable because this is not truly what you want to do and you're not able to bring in all the parts of yourself in the workplace. Um, while you were talking and you mentioned LinkedIn, um, there's so much that is uh, happening on LinkedIn. And yeah. So one suggestion that I have for all graduates, if you don't have a LinkedIn page already, 
and create one and get familiar with it. You can make great connections on LinkedIn. And there's also a whole host of um, learning opportunities because Google owns LinkedIn, as I recently learned, and there are free classes that you can log on to and utilize, especially while you are, we are all still sheltering in place during the pandemic so that you can learn new skills and stay current for free of charge. Um, but Teresa, Teresa, be careful with your social media presence and what you have out there, because I can say that it's looked at when we, you're going in for an interview, the first thing people do is look you up, right? They want to see, you know, a little bit more about you so that they can have that connection when they meet with you. Definitely. And you should make sure it's a presence that you are proud of. You know, I always, and that stuff uh, does not go away. If I could just piggyback on what Patty is saying, that stuff does not disappear. Um, you think you've deleted it, but there are all kinds of ways, and that's part of what I do during the day, is find out information about people that they don't want to be found. So be very <laughs> careful about your online presence. Definitely. Um, and, you know, I used to say that Facebook was for family, friends, family and friends, and uh, foolishness. and LinkedIn was for profession, uh, but more and more people just get your resume and they go to your page, whether they tell you they have or not. So, uh, yes, you have the power to say and do whatever you like, but be aware that people are looking and searching you to make decisions about your character and make hiring decisions and decide whether they want you to be a part of their organization. As we move on to the next question, you know, we were talking about the job market and going on to work. Um, and this, we know, is a really different job market for the class of 2020. Um, and it looks very different from the class last year. It looks very different from three months ago. Um, candidates are going to have really um, a difficult and very different time while they're searching for employment. Um, what are some of the challenges that you think people may face and do you have any suggestions for them? Well, I'll start with that. For their first job. I'll start with that. So, so one thing to know is that PwC is the largest recruiter of on-campus um, graduates uh, in, in, in the U.S. So we, we, we hire between interns and, and direct campus hires. It's, it's a significant number every year. And so what, what's different now for us is that normally when you join a firm, and if you join any company, normally you get to interact, you meet people, you talk, you get to sit next to them and learn from them. And now it's all going to be virtual for now, right? So, so yes, it's, it's going to be completely different. And one of the things that's important when you sit next to someone is that you can establish relationships. You can get to know each other. You can go out to lunch. And how you establish relationships virtually is going to be way different. And actually, it plays to the point that you just mentioned around your social media presence, how they're going to learn a lot about you is by looking you up, right? So, so it's going to be very important um, that when you, when you, when you're on calls and when you're, when you start working for a firm or wherever you may work, if it's, if it's digital, quite frankly, you should, you need to be visible, right? I'm looking here and I'm seeing a lot of people. Are, they don't have their screens on, it's going to be visible for, it's going to be important for you to be visible so that people know, get to know you, get to know your mannerisms, but also it gets, it starts with, with how do, how do they begin to trust you, right? Because if I'm on a call and I can't see people, I don't know whether or not they're paying attention to me or not, or they focused or they're dealing with like watching TV, like, so it's very important to make sure that, that when you're interacting virtually, any opportunity that you have to, to make a connection visually, you should be focused on that. Um, I do think the whole interview process will be different, right? It, you, you probably will be online, um, at least if you're looking for jobs in the immediate future, and all of that needs to be visual. You need to make sure you show up, you're dressed professionally and all of that, but that the people can see you. And, and work hard at establishing relationships quickly um, because trust is key to getting the right assignments for people to, you know, just understand what you're capable of doing. So, you know, 
because you're not sitting next to the person, they're not training you side by side, you're going to really have to focus on how to make relationships virtually. And that starts with allowing yourself to be seen. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, we, uh, Sullivan and Cromwell is a lot more exclusive in their hiring practices, um, particularly for the associates. And, the, and, you know, we haven't started talking about money, but the starting salary for associates at Sullivan and Cromwell is about 170K a year. Um, and the librarian salaries are just about as competitive. We get paid about what a first year associate would get paid. Um, and so, you know, it, you, and teams are very important and we work in a team. Um, now we have the, we have the privilege of having, you know, worked together side by side. And now that we have this virtual presence, you know, we, we have a different, you know, we have our, 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 our way of communication, our corporate, um, you know, uh, speak, so to say. Um, so, so those types of things are already, but we are now looking to hire somebody. Um, so that's going to be very interesting, the dynamic of this new person coming into this already established team. So you want to think about those types of things, um, you know, paying attention to how people interact, paying attention to how they communicate with each other. Um, but the job force is going to look incredibly different. I mean, I don't even think we're going to have summer associates this year, and we're probably going to push back the start of fall associates. Um, so the job market is going to look incredibly different. The types of jobs, the economy um, is going to be drastically changing. So um, you're going to have to be adaptable. Um, you know, you may end up doing something that you did not go to school for, um, but you know, you have to be able to adapt and adjust to 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 the job market as it is changing. Agility is key, right? That this was what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. Being being agile. Um, and and I do agree, we are seeing a slowdown of our hiring um, through this process um, until companies actually figure out like, what does all this mean? So exactly. I will share in my role um, at PwC, one of the things that I'm responsible for is the return to office. And like, what does that look like? Like, how do we, like, we, the, I have 11,000 people in my market. It was very easy to shut the doors, but when you think about opening up again, it's a whole nother ball game. And our office is on the corner of 42nd Street in Madison, our New York office. It's in the middle of like Grand Central and all these other places with yicky germs. And, you know, how do we make our environment safe? And we're going with the guiding principles of ensuring the safety of our staff um, first and foremost. But um, believe it or not, I'm so proud that we were able to like at the drop of a hat become a virtual organization. And now that people are virtual, I got to tell you, a lot of people are happy staying home. And so how do we get people back into the office? Um, yeah, there's a lot of pressure around that and and timing. Like, I don't think we'll be pulled back into the office until after um, uh, some type of vaccination is, is found. And so you may find yourself working remotely for a, long, a longer period than you really think. Thank you for that. You know, as uh, we struggle to try to figure this all out, it's a new world for all of us. It's really going to make the world of work look different. Um, and it may take a longer time for people to be able to establish themselves and have to figure out how do I maneuver in this new reality. Um, so yeah. as people are thinking about what their first jobs are going to be now that they are newly minted Medgar Evers graduates. Um, what are some of the suggestions that you have for the job search and looking for employment? Are there sites or organizations that you would recommend that people explore? Sure, Kim, you and I like the length of time that we've been working, right? So mm -hmm. when I got to tell you, like when I first went away to college, believe it or not, I went with a typewriter. Like we didn't have <laughs> computers at that point. I had a word processor. Um, you know, <laughs> we're all and, there. And, oh, you, you were lucky. You had a data processor. I had like a click, 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 click typewriter. And 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 when I was actually looking for a job, you know, we had recruiters. Now everything is all online, right? Um, which which can sometimes feel distant, right? right? So at least when you were going to see a recruiter, you sat in front of someone, you got to dialogue, and I feel like you you got to hone in on your interview skills through that process. Whereas now you're just submitting a resume into like Never Never Land and you're waiting. 
so so I think I think this job search is going to require a lot of patience, a lot of persistence. If you have not done so, you need to have at least five people look at your resume because there's always somebody who has a little extra to add, a period here, maybe there's a comma, a capital, you know, and and so one thing like I have worked for PwC for 22 years, but I just recently changed jobs two years ago. And I remember they were like, get your resume. And I was like, oh, like I haven't done a resume in 20 years. Um, but you know, the whole process of like, you know, interviewing, like to be honest with you, the more you do it, the better you are at it. So I for me, it wasn't that bad because I interview people all the time for on sitting on the other side of the desk. And that actually helped me through the interview process because I know what to say and what not to say. But I would honestly say I would look for a mentor through this process, someone who's in the in the in the you know already working and established that can help talk to you around the interview process what your resume should look like how you should dress how you should interact that that would be my suggestion um mm -hmm. yeah that, that's where i would go and 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 quite frankly a lot of it is on linkedin that's where we look for people is through linkedin um and recruiters look that way that's how come it's important with that social presence Oh yeah, no. I I mean, I get a lot of um, I get a lot of solicitations from LinkedIn, and um, I have to you know keep you know politely declining. Um, but um, you're right. Like I I sat down with a headhunter, um, and you know went through that process. To, so that's how I got at, to Sullivan and Cromwell. Um, but for McKinsey and Company, it was word of mouth. Um, so associations, organizations are incredibly important. Um, you know, like uh, organizations like um, the, was the, the National Coalition of 100, was 100 women, I'm sorry, I'm going to totally turn that. Uh, 100 <laughs> black women, um, you know, they're professional associations. Like I said, I was president of the Law Library Association of Greater New York. We have um, student membership. As a matter of fact, student membership is free. Uh, for um, the Law Library Association of Greater New York. Uh, so think about the profession that you're interested in. Find out if there's an association that is affiliated with that. Um, and that's how you can find mentors because it's going to be very important if you're not going to be physically present. Um, you know, you find someone who's, who's doing what you want to do. Um, and almost every industry has some type of association. If you want to be a lawyer, there's the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. Um, if you want to, you know, go into business, there's um, there there was Nesby. There's all there are all kinds of associations. I'm sure at Mega Average, um, you know, you can find those. And then there are those social organizations as well. Um, you know, sororities, fraternities, and those types of things. And um, you know, through affiliation. Uh, with those organizations, you can find people who are already in the industry. So I think what Patty said is 100% correct. You know, you have to find someone who's doing what you want to do and figure out a way to have a conversation with that individual. Okay. So we're going to move on a little bit. I want to talk. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I was, also gonna, I was also going to say that I am sure Medgar Evers also has some type of development office that helps through that process. Right. And so you need to get to know whoever's working there um, because they know about roles and jobs and opportunities. Um, some of them may be paying, some may be volunteer, whatever, but things that will get you the experience to get you along your path and journey. So reach out to what your guidance team or guidance counselor um, who can help you through that as well. You utilize your university resources. And I would just also like to add is sometimes when students are in school, they haven't utilized those services as often as um, they may might have. Uh, however, just because you're graduating, you are now an alumni of the school. And I'm sure mm -hmm. your school has an alumni association and would love for people to be active and give back and get involved in the programming so that you're uh, so that the School of Business is all the more richer. Um, as we moved on, I want to talk a little bit about money, which is always the big thing. Um, have what, uh, what, if any, financial mistakes have you made around money? <laughs> and what are some of the suggestions with that you can give um, to the audience for talking about money and uh, recovering from mistakes. 
Um, so we were talking yesterday. We were talking yesterday about, um, and there, there was a little bit of debate about salary and salary demands and, and, and things of that nature. So as I, as I shared, when I came to Sullivan and Cromwell, I came as a power professional. I came from McKinsey and Company to the law firm. Um, and so when I was, when I switched from, and you, you get salary increases, but you usually don't have those conversations about, you know, what everybody else is making. So when I was promoted from power professional to professional, um, you know, they began to realize as they hired other people that my salary was so low. It was so very low that they had to increase my salary by almost 57% in order to get me to market rate. Um, so one of the things, um, you know, so, 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 and I knew that I knew that I wasn't making as much money as I should be making. And so one of the things that I regret not doing, but, you know, I'm a prayerful person. So I prayed about it and thank God my boss was honest. Um, but, um, so that I didn't have to go in and make a demand. Um, but you begin to kind of realize that, you know, there's value to what you're doing. Um, and that the firm is charging their clients a certain amount of money for what it is that you're doing. Um, so I think it's very important to know what you're worth, um, not necessarily make a demand, but be educated around what the income brackets are for the industry that you're going in. So like the law library, uh, the American Association of Law Librarians, they do salary surveys. And so you can actually pull up those annual salary surveys and see, you know, what the pay range should be um, for your education, for your experience. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that I, that I wish I had done um, earlier. And I wish I had been as smart as Patty's kids and was able to go to school for free. But that didn't happen. <laughs> we talked about that. So I had two, three student <laughs> loans that I had to take back. I got credit cards when I was in college, and I think that was a big mistake. It was a huge mistake. Not only credit cards, but department store cards. Um, And, you know, they'll give you these things that you have absolutely no income. And, you know, and then, you know, you go calling your mom and your dad, like, mom, can you help me pay this? Um, So I would strongly advise, um, you know, if you're going to get a credit card, get one credit card and try to make sure that the APR is competitive. And have those conversations with, you know, with, with the credit card company to make sure that you are getting a, a, a annual percentage rate that is competitive. Um, and make sure you pay your bills on time so that you are able to negotiate down. Um, don't, don't spend more than you bring in. Do not do that. So I, I, I too, was the credit card I too was the credit card queen, right? So I I I, I got caught up in, in in the credit madness. Um, so it's funny you mentioned my kids. So so one thing we did um, with the kids is did not allow them to get a credit card until their senior year. And the reason for that is because at that point, then we need you to start establishing credit. Um, I shared yesterday, like once you move out, like and you go away to college, there's no backsies, right? So you need to start establishing credit so that you can, you can you can pay rent and you can get like an apartment and all of that type of stuff. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my son. Um, so Kyle um, graduated last May um, from DePaul University in Indianapolis. Um, and um, decided to stay out there. Um, and, and we were very fortunate in terms of no cost and all of that other type of stuff. And I still have a daughter that's in school right now at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, hopefully she'll be going back in September. My fingers are crossed. I know that that's a big issue for all of us now. Um, and so when we think about you know guidance around finances when you first come out of school, Money's going to be tight. Like it's it's going to be tight. Nobody's coming out making these grandiose salaries. And so when you think about like what 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 will you when you graduate? Like are you going home to live with your parents? Are you going to stay there? Do you want to live on your own? Do you you know like what what do you need? Do you have a car? Those types of things. And then and then kind of plan around that, right? Because if your if your salary has to get eaten up every single month making these credit card payments for things that you don't even remember what you brought. It was a waste of money. It was a waste of money. So I, I suggest if you have any type of job now that you're working on the side or doing anything like that, try to save something. Save, save. Like there's always a rainy day. Um, sure, you know, you some of you may be blessed to have parents that can help support you. Some of you may not. And you always need to have your own little nest egg to be able to um, 
you know, to survive because we don't know how long the job search will be, right? You may find a job, you may have one when you graduate. Unfortunately, my son did. That was like truly a blessing and he's been um, phenomenal and been able to maintain his job because I'm like, you got to keep it because you're not covered back. Um, but, but, you know, just trying to kind of think about like, you know, how much money do you really need to survive? And if you're staying here in New York City and you're in Brooklyn, like rent is expensive. So, you know, be willing to to, to saddle up and, 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 you know, you don't need to spend every penny that you make and, and save something for a rainy day. That that would be my, my, best, my best thought on that. Great, thank you so much for sharing that, both of you. You know, it's so often we have a reluctance to talk about money and the real mistakes that we have made because I too had the credit cards and it's like, why do I have a part-time job and I'm going to date myself but at the time minimum wage was three dollars and 35 cents an hour Ooh, I, <laughs> I don't remember that <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like uh what did I need with uh three credit cards like so those were hard lessons and took years for you to me to recover from um so i always think that it's important to talk to people as you graduate about money because you will begin getting the offers if you have not already done so there's some secret list that they say this person is a senior let me send them every solicitation possible and don't be like don't be negotiate you know there's always a better deal i mean like whether it's your cell phone bill or it's a credit card bill or you know whatever and even if they're you know like creditors for different things, don't don't hide from your creditors make sure you talk to them um you know but again you know try very hard to you know think about how much money is coming in how much money needs to go out and try to you know fashion your lifestyle as such and make sure you put a little bit aside to do things that you enjoy because if you're just saving 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 and not doing anything that's not that's not cool either and pay your student loans don't default on that i got to tell you i got to tell you something one of the most powerful things that you can have in life is a good credit score i'm telling you cuz if you if your credit score is bad it will impact you forever it's hard to get out of that you know, you want to try to monitor that, like monitor where you are, like, and, and, and really work toward that credit score. Because as Kim mentioned, negotiate, you can't negotiate if your credit score is bad. You've got to really focus on that. And I, I would start, there's a lot of free companies that you can get your credit score, start looking at it and monitoring it um, and try, you know, set some target goals for yourself because that credit score is, is, is key. And one thing that will bring it down real quickly is defaulting on a student loan. I have a question. We we live in um, the school is based in Central Brooklyn, and Brooklyn is one of the um, well, really all of New York City is has high, very high housing cost, and um, that is something that many of our student body struggles with in terms of housing. Um, but many of them are also very committed to living in certain parts of Brooklyn or Queens or or, or New York City in the Bronx or what have you. Um, what is do you, do you recommend or advise that they look to seek cheaper housing whenever possible or do you recommend that they do try to stay where they're at um, if it's close to um, what they knew growing up so well, i think you have to do what's most important for yourself um but i think that you know there, there are ways that you can you know figure out i mean if you got to get a roommate you know to in order to you know stay where you'd like to stay or um, I mean, there are some affordable housing, you know, uh, projects throughout the city, um, but there's also a move right now uh, to create community land trusts. So there are some things that are happening, and this is where your civic engagement is really important, where it's important that you know what's going on in your community, um, know, you know, what's happening. Because they're, 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 they're um, like, like right now, there's a group that's trying to start in East New York, a community land trust. A community land trust is where um, you know, they're vacant lots and, and they set these things aside and the community then owns that property and they can develop it. They can put commercial space there. They can put housing there, um, but they can put things there that will actually, you know, remain affordable to the community. But if you're, and if you're involved and if you know about these things, then you can take advantage of these things. But if you don't know about it, then, you know, you, 
not so much. But if it's if if you know, I have a lot of friends who have moved to New Jersey because it's cheap to live in New Jersey. Um, but I just couldn't do that to myself. I just couldn't do it. So, uh, like my my son is in Indianapolis. It's real cheap. <laughs> So he, you know, so it works out well for him, right? You, he, you know, he's a beautiful apartment. It's almost nothing. But this is my thought. Um, when I got out of school, right, so I had lived on campus. I came back home. Like, living with my mom was just, like, not fun. Like, I, I, I didn't like it. Like, I, I want to do what I want to do. And so what did I do? Like, I moved into a small studio apartment. I started small. Like, you, you start out with the basics. Um, and slowly work my way up, but but just like how we talk about like starting at the, at the basic when you go into a job market, you need to think about that in terms of housing and and don't overextend yourself, right? Don't overextend yourself. And when you talk about roommates, I'm not big on that. And I also feel like if you have your own place, never let anybody stay because it's hard to get them out. Like if you have your own space, <laughs> be very selfish with your space. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I would say look, look within your means. And I know it's hard to find. And if it means you have to move out of town or you got to move to New Jersey or an area that you may not be used to, be open to that. Flexibility and agility is going to be important in housing. It definitely is. You know, as the director is a pro of a program that provides housing, um, I have this conversation probably every day with someone. Um, people wanting to return to their old communities and it not being uh, feasible because of the, they have been outpriced of the neighborhood due to gentrification and forces beyond their control. Um, and, you know, I'll take me from example, I told um, the other panelists on the call yesterday, I'm from, I'm from Brooklyn, but I live in the Bronx. And you know, you just don't do that. Brooklynites don't really move to the Bronx. We don't move to Queens, but we don't move to the Bronx. But I had to move someplace where I was going to be comfortable and that I could afford. So, you know, when I got my first apartment, I moved in with a roommate and we were really good friends. And after that two year lease was up, Let's just say it greatly affected our friendship. <laughs> um, so it, it, it was really challenging. Even when you think that you know people well, it, you have not lived yeah. with them. And it's hard yeah. living with people who are not your immediate family who you're going to give a pass to. So it, you have to, if you do choose to get a roommate, you have to have really open and frequent conversations. And I always encourage people who are going to do that is to have a written document. We had we did a roommate agreement because there were just things that were driving me crazy and that were deal breakers for me. And that's like, if we were are going to be able to continue this lease, then we have to set some ground rules, which is something that we didn't do when we moved in together. And it made, um, much more livable and bearable that we could be able to live out our lives. And when, uh, you know, we were able to move, um, I moved into a studio apartment by myself. It's like, I don't need a living room. I, I just need to be with me. And so I downsized and um, making the decision to move from Brooklyn to the Bronx, I was able to move into a two bedroom apartment with a terrace for the apart that the amount that I was paying for my one bedroom in Brooklyn. Mm. So, well, again, know, that's where that it, advocacy all, is it, important. That's that's yeah. You know, that's where it's all to in get involved what is in the most world. important. It's all in what's the most important to you. Rather, and you have to are going to have to make those hard decisions. Is it more important to have a smaller space and remain in Brooklyn, or whatever your community or neighborhood is and you know I'm always going to be connected to Brooklyn because probably 90% of the people that I know and love live in Brooklyn so I'm still going to be in East Flatbush several times a week after after COVID of course and you know what <laughs> and don't and don't don't feel bad staying home like don't feel bad like 
stay with your parents as long as you can and save the money if you want. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. No shame in that. And that's a decision. That Unless it's have. my kids, because they got to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's a decision that people are making, you know, um, much uh, making much more frequently to remain at home and give themselves some time in order to save some money and uh, establish their careers and make some decisions about where they want to go next. So that's always a um, possibility. Kim, I, I liked when you when you mentioned that it is important for our students to know their worth, um, particularly their professional worth. Uh, and we talk about, um, at least anecdotally, all of us, um, all of the students, about how much money they think they should make after they graduate college, how much they would like to make, um, and um, or as you were saying, maybe accepting a position not knowing. Um, what kind of salary they should actually ask for. Um, what can, um, in addition to what you said, what else can our students do even before they graduate to know what, what they're worth with their industry? And this is also for you, uh, Patty. Uh, where, where can students find out what they're, um, what they're worth based on their degrees? If they wanted to come into to Price Waterhouse Cooper, for example, I think Kim is 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 frozen. Lost her. So, so my suggestion would be to again to read and do research. Spend some time. LinkedIn provides information. There are various websites where you can put in jobs that you're interested in, and it will tell you salaries. Um, I, I, you you really have to just spend the time to research to look and and just find out, and then just also understand that. If you find if you find something and the job is you know sixty thousand dollars a year starting, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that day one that that's where you'll be. I know um, when we talked yesterday, we talked about you know what happens if during your job search someone asks you what what are you looking for. That's a very tricky question because when you say when someone says what are you looking for in terms of compensation, you could say you know what I'm looking for forty thousand and they're willing to pay 60 and now you've kind of undercut yourself i know myself and my job search when i was looking many many years ago i always told them that i'm expecting to get paid what they feel is a fair wage to to based upon the value of what i bring and then see what they come to me with i um, mean i can tell you every time i've done that they've come in with a number higher than i ever expected to get paid so, so, so be careful about boxing yourself out from a compensation, like understand and know what you expect by doing your research. Um, but I know just from my experience, um, not putting a number out has worked for me. And if they come to you with a number, you can then negotiate, right? Then you can say, you know what, hey, you're offering me 40, but you know, is there a signing bonus? You're offering me 40, could you go up a little bit? Is there tuition reimbursement? A lot of schools pay for your student loans. Um, you know, like what other benefits are there? I think you need to think about compensation as a complete package. Um, it's not just the dollars that you get paid in your paycheck, but it's also how much time off do I get? How, you know, like, well, how much is the medical? Is there a wage works card that pays for my transportation? Will I be traveling? Like, you've got to look at the whole complete compensation package. Um, because there are some benefits that you could get that make, make some jobs more enticing than others. Um, I, I would I would make sure we look at the complete compensation package. And when you're not sure, if someone comes to you and says, you know what, this job is paying forty five thousand, and you feel like it's light, that's when I would reach out to my mentor. I would reach out to my 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 what I, I'm not sure what the department is called in Med Drivers, but like your 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 career, job, planning. your career planning career services department, and, and and talk to them. Hey, they're offering this. What do you think? It's similar to when you got when you applied to college and you got different financial aid packages. You had to weigh it, like you know what's better, what's you know what's better for me, um, and 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 it, it could even include like how far do I have to travel every day? What are the hours that I have to work? Um, you know, PWC pays very good salaries, but believe me, 
on average, I'm working 16 hours a day. So like, you got to weigh it, right? Like it, it's, so it, there's a lot of things that go into that, but right. yeah, yeah. A lot of things to consider. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the, from the audience? Checking my, my chat boxes here. Let's see. Do you, um, I know someone mentioned looking up salaries on salary.com. Is that still a, uh, a site that is, that is, is reputable? Do you know? I, I don't know, but I'll put it to you this way. I would get information from as many places as you can. And yeah. then you see it, you compare it, right? Nobody's going to have an exact compensation number because every job that you go to pays differently. Every company pays differently. So I would get it, get it from multiple resources and then see what the average of that is. And then you kind of know what you're looking for. Yeah. I mean, like, as I, as I shared earlier, they have salary surveys for my profession. So I'm sure other professions do the same thing, which will give you a range. But one of the cool things that I was able to do um, we work, I work at a law firm and we have bankruptcy cases. And so the bank, they have to file a claim with the bankruptcy lawyer or the judge in order to let them know how much is being paid. So I was able to see the hourly rate of the associates of the paralegals and, and those types of things. And, and again, like understanding that, you know, the firm is charging this much money to the client per hour for your time. But you might not see all of that because they're factoring in all those other kinds of things. So, I mean, like what 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 Patty said was was spot on. Some of the other things that you can take into consideration besides uh, vacation time, sick time. Um, there's also does people do you pay for parking? That's and you're used to driving. You don't want to take the subway. Do, are you going to work at a place that will uh, provide you with parking or, or with a transit check in order to get to work. Um, are you able to work remotely from home, which will be more and more important as COVID lasts, you know, for the next several months and probably into next year. Um, are you able to uh, what kind of other benefits do you have? Uh, you'll be surprised how quickly health insurance will eat up your paycheck, especially if you have to provide health insurance for yourself and um, uh, dependents, if you have children you can, or a spouse. You can stay on your parents' health insurance until you're 26. Stay on it. If you're on it, stay on it, because it saves you a lot of money. <laughs> and if they aren't willing to pay for you, I suggest you negotiate with them. With them. <laughs> and pay them the money for your health insurance to allow you to do so. Well, we're, we're at our five o'clock hour. Are there any questions that we have for Tim Council or Patty Bartos? I see our students here very active at other times. So I wanted to ask, are there any questions before we, we uh, sign off, log off this afternoon? If there's no questions, the only thing I would say is that I am on LinkedIn and feel free to connect with me. I'm glad to talk with you and answer any questions that you may have in the future. So uh, feel free. It's Patty, I think it's, I think I'm listed under Patricia Bartos. So uh, feel free yes, to connect with are. me on LinkedIn, okay? Dr. Roll, would you like to make oh. some closing comments, please? I know I caught you. <laughs> Thank you everyone for attending. I've really enjoyed uh, the presentations, telling us your personal story, uh, the good, the bad, and uh, helping the students figure out what place they want to chart for their course in their career. So thank you very much. Don't do that, don't do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, I want to, to thank Patty Bartos, Kim Council, and Teresa Young, as well as the National Coalition for 100 Black Women for sponsoring and co-hosting this event with Medgar Evers College. Again, thank you all, and I hope to see you later this evening at our, what is it tonight, game night and after party. So join us. <laughs> the links on Eventbrite. Okay.
Congratulations again, graduates. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, ladies. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.